Good evening, everybody. Welcome. My name is Kati Verest, and I work for uh, Radboud Reflex. And um, this Saturday, we are very honored to receive Daniel Dennett as our guest. And he's going to talk about the concept of uh, free will. Um, but today, Mark Slors, professor of philosophy of minds, will tell you something more about the background and the work of Daniel Dennett, so, you, so that you can go um, to the lecture on Saturday and be a little bit more prepared and then yeah, you can know what you can expect. So uh, first, uh, Mark Slors will tell you something about um, the work and background of Daniel Dennett as a philosopher. And then after his lecture, there will be time for you to ask any questions. So first, I will want to give the floor to Mark Slors. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to, to say something about Daniel Dennett here. Uh, so I was given the task of saying something in general about um, uh, the work of Daniel Dennett and his, sort of his, his philosophical background. Um, and um, that's quite impossible to do in one hour. So I, I, I definitely need to make some choices and uh, skip like about 80% of, uh, of his works. Uh, it's just impossible to tell, to, to give you an overview of the kind of work that he does. But I, I will start with a sort of very brief uh, overview of the books that he published. Um, he published. He actually published more books than you can see here. Um, some of these books are collections of essays and he published like, I don't know how many more essays uh, than you can see um, uh, that, 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 are, that are published in the books here. Uh, but he published a lot. This is just to give you an impression of, of the, the sheer size of his work. I mean, it's, he's a very prolific writer, um, um, uh, and, I mean, he, and he's very old, and he started relatively young, so he had a long time to uh, produce what he did. Um, so what I will do, I, I will just go through... Um, I don't know, 11 books that you can see here, just to give you an overview of the kind of stuff that he uh, wrote about, uh, and also to give you some idea of, um, of the development throughout his life of, of interests and topics that he um, uh, wrote about. And then I want to tell you something about um, two of the four or five main themes in his work. Uh, I, will, I will start with saying something about uh, what is known as the intentional stance theory. That's sort of his first claim to fame, if you want. Uh, it's, that, that is work from the uh, early 70s onwards to, I don't know, early 90s or something. Uh, that's a very important concept, the intentional stance. I'll tell you something about that. And then I'll say something about free will. Um, not very much, because there is... I mean, you can only do so much in, uh, in one hour, but I picked those topics because I think, but I'm not sure, because I'm not sure what he's going to say on Saturday, but I think that these are the topics that might give you sort of um, the most relevant background to understand what he will be doing on, on Saturday. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just start with the, uh, with the books. Um, this is the first book, so Content and Consciousness is Dennis' first book. Uh, and it's basically a reworking of his PhD thesis, which he wrote in uh, Oxford under the supervision of Gilbert Ryle. For those of you who've done, who know something about philosophy, Gilbert Ryle is sort of one of the like, really, really famous um, philosophers of the 20th century. And he was um, uh, Dennett's supervisor. And in this book, he sort of sets out uh, a large part of what you might call his early... Uh, philosophical program or project and uh, as the title uh, conveniently suggests he says there are two topics in the philosophy of mind um, that I will be concentrating on for uh, uh, well perhaps the upcoming 20 years from this book is from 1969 uh, and uh, it's, it, he, he was sort of working on these two issues content and consciousness I'll tell you something about them briefly um, these two topics for about 25 years after this. In this book, he sort of sets out the program. Um, not, not exactly as he carried it out, but almost. So content refers to um, mental states such as beliefs and desires. Right? 
and um, beliefs, desires, intentions, hopes, um, mental states that are about something. So content is also referred to by philosophers in, in a sort of more jargon-like way as intentionality, and intentionality is usually glossed as something like aboutness. So thoughts can be about certain things. Hopes can be about certain things. Fears can be about certain things. And this aboutness relation is usually referred to by philosophers as intentionality. And sort of the mental side of that is what is referred to as mental content. So one question that Dennett wanted to ask himself is, okay, how is it possible that mental states can have content? How is it possible that mental states can be about certain things? More colloquially put, how can we have beliefs and desires? That's one thing. And another problem is the problem of consciousness. And consciousness is defined, sort of, it's not defined, it's characterized as um, the subjective feel that experience has, that thinking has, that hoping has, that experiencing emotions has. So there is one side of the mental life that is characterized by, say, subjectivity, Right? By, by the fact that it feels like something to experience something or to think about something. There's another side of the mental life, of our mental lives, that is characterized by the fact that a lot of our mental states are about something. So that's content and consciousness. Um, consciousness is what he would be working on after, say, 20 years later uh, than uh, 1969 roughly, 22 years later, uh, and content is what he started with. And I'll tell you, some, tell you something about consciousness in, uh, in, a, in a moment, um, and I'll skip uh, consciousness entirely, because his theory of consciousness is very complex, very controversial, as is most of his other stuff, by the way. I mean, a lot of the things that Dennett wrote about are very, very controversial. Um, but, okay, I'll defend him tonight. Because I think there's, there's something extremely interesting about the stuff that he wrote. Um, so content and consciousness. And what he says basically is, um, my project is to explain how content and consciousness, and together content and consciousness sort of make up most of our mental lives. So content and consciousness cover roughly the concept of a mind. Um, my project is to explain how the mind, content and consciousness, um, can exist in the natural world. So I would like to explain how these things can exist without sort of invoking anything magical or mysterical. Uh, I, I want to explain it in naturalistic terms, that is, in terms that are completely in line with what contemporary physical science tells us about the universe. So he is a materialist, as it is called. Um, but he's a materialist of a very specific kind. He's a materialist, he says everything Ultimately, everything that exists is material. Um, but nevertheless, there is a sort of irreducible place that we can um, assign to the mind and ultimately even to free will. I'll get to free will in a moment. Okay, um, so his project is entirely naturalistic, as it is called. Um, but he's also very, very much um, against the idea that, th that this naturalism means that we can reduce the mind to physics. It's not just physics. There is some sense to be given to the idea that although the mind is entirely physical, um, this does not mean that we can sort of do away with the mind and just stick to you know, whatever we can say about the universe in physicalistic terms. So I'll get to that later. Um, okay. Those are the first two topics, of, and probably the main topics, of his, uh, of his work. And he set out the program in, uh, in the first book. And then in the second book, Brainstorms, that's the sort of collection of essays in which he roughly um, elaborates on this notion of content and on what is later to be known as the intentional stance, in which I'll tell you something about shortly. And then he has a sort of interlude in 1984, uh, and he wrote a book about free will, and free will is sort of the third topic that's very important in his, uh, in his works. Free will becomes, I don't know, it's, it's, sort of, it's, it's sort of an on and off topic every now and then. So it pops up every now and then in his, in his writings, and then he writes uh, about other stuff, and then suddenly he writes about free will again. So free will is the third topic. Um, very, very good book, by the way. So if you, I mean, this is probably one of, this is a purely subjective opinion, but um, 
It is one of the best books that he wrote. I, I actually think that the Elbow Room and the Intentional Stance, which is the next book, uh, those are, I mean, they're, they're incredibly brilliant books. Um, not all his books are brilliant, but those two definitely are. Um, okay, Free Will pops up and then goes away again. Then he starts writing again about the intentional stance and he sort of improves on the theory that he s first started with in Content and Consciousness, wrote something about in Brainstorms, and then in the in intentional stance, which is again a collection of essays, he elaborates on this notion um, and goes into it much, more, much deeper than he did uh, before. And that sort of completes his um, philosophy about, say, the mind in terms of mental content, of intentionality. Um, it's very important work, and it's definitely the groundwork of everything else he wrote, but then he sort of left it. Uh, and he moved on to consciousness, which was the second part of what he set out to be as his you know, general project. And he wrote this book uh, called uh, Consciousness Explained. It was influential, uh, but also... Um, well, I will, I will tell you in a minute why the intentional stance was sort of controversial, but this book was really controversial. And it was not that well received. And um, I guess Dennis is one of those philosophers who sort of, you, you have to give him some time. So uh, when he wrote the intentional stance, everyone said, nah, this can't be right. This is just, just a sort of as if theory. This cannot be the, the right story about the mind. When he wrote about consciousness it, and, and he called the book Consciousness Explained, everyone's saying, this is not about consciousness. This book should be called Consciousness Ignored. And everyone was sort of really furious about it. What you see now about the, uh, sort of the, the opinion has changed with respect to the intentional stance. So many people now sort of change their mind and think, me too, um, and think, okay, there might be something uh, that's probably much to the whole notion of an intentional stance and we can actually use it. You can see the same happening now with respect to consciousness explained. People are more open to his ideas. But I won't say anything about consciousness any more than this. Um, then he moves on to what is what later becomes a very, very important topic in his, uh, in his thought, which is... Um, Darwinian evolution, the theory of natural selection. Um, and that, that becomes a very, very uh, important um, uh, topic in his, uh, in his general work. This is 1995. Um, and, okay, so roughly he writes a book about Darwinianism and about its all-pervasiveness. Um, I'll skip some books because otherwise I won't get... Uh, the, 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 the books on kinds of minds and brain children are, again, collections of essays. And then in 2003, and I'll tell you something about that, um, he returns to the notion of free will. Um, and basically what he does is he combines his original thoughts in Elbow Room, which was the first book about free will, and he combines it with um, his thoughts about Darwinian evolution theory. Uh, and that becomes a really nice and interesting uh, new perspective on, on free will, and I'll, I'll tell you something about that as well. Uh, just to sort of finish all, all his books. Sweet Dreams is a sort of rehash of Consciousness Explained and he sort of corrects mistakes and also mistaken uh, uh, perceptions of his book. Um, by now, we have four themes that are very important in his work. Content, one, tell you something about it. Consciousness, I'll ignore that. Uh, free will, I'll tell you something about that. And evolution theory, just a tiny little bit. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about evolution, but not, not very much. And then at the end, um, we have, in 2006, or 10 years ago, a book on religion. Um, that's his fifth theme. Uh, but it's a completely freestanding thing. It's, it, it doesn't have anything to do with his previous work, other than a sort of general pro-scientific attitude. And it's very much written for the American uh, public. In, I mean, religion in America plays a different role than it plays in Europe. And so he's, 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 this is a very critical book about religion. Uh, and he is very uh, critical about religion. He's a, 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 a very outspoken uh, atheist. Um, but for us, that's perhaps less interesting than for the American public, where this plays a much more important role. And then finally, in 2013, this is a sort of Dennett's greatest hits uh, book, in which he has a sort of popular popularized version of all his well, greatest hits. And he has a lot of greatest hits because, I mean, he has a, a really, he has a, an immense lot of truly innovative and new ideas. Um, 
which I will tell you about now. Okay, so we'll start with the intentional stance. I'll just take the time. Um, yep. Um, start with the intentional stance. The intentional stance is um, uh, the, uh, the original idea of the intentional stance theory is as old as 1971. So it's two years after he published his first book, um, and he, then he, he published a paper in which he suggested the idea of the intentional stance. And I'll, I'll try to explain as briefly as I can what the general idea about it is, and then um, I'll start with an example, and then I'll switch from the example to uh, human beings. So the example that I'll start with is the example that Dennett starts with. It's controversial, and he sort of, he didn't really recant, but he, he said, you know, there are tricky things about this example, but it helps so well that I use it here now as well. So this is um, a chess computer. This is not a, a real game of chess, this is a chess computer. So imagine you're playing a game of chess against the computer. And you make a move, and you wonder what the next move of the computer will be. So you make a certain move, and then and you, you think, okay, now, now I'm curious to see what the computer will do. How will you find out? How will you um, figure out what the best prediction is of what the computer will do? Mm. Well, you can adopt various strategies, says Dennett. And the first thing you can do is just acknowledge that the computer is a physical machine. It's made up of atoms and molecules, uh, and atoms and molecules behave in very lawful ways, and we have a sort of rough idea of what, you know, what the laws of physics are. Suppose we have a general idea of what that is. Then you can treat the, um, the chess computer as a physical device, and you can, well, no, you can't, but you can... Imagine that some imaginary god would be able to calculate the positions of each of the molecules in the computer, combine that with uh, his knowledge about the laws of nature, and then ultimately running down, I don't know, I don't know how many millions of computations, you finally get a prediction of what the computer will do. Which is just a, basic, a very, a, it's, it's a physical prediction. You treat the machine as a physical device, um, you record all the physical options, all the, phys the physical features of, uh, of the device, and you just you, you use your knowledge of the laws of nature to calculate what the machine's next move will be. It's impossible in practice, but in theory, it will work. And uh, a theoretical god would be able to predict the, uh, the next move of, this, of the chess computer with 100% accuracy if the laws of, if, if our knowledge of, the, of, or his knowledge of the laws of nature is perfect. Yeah? That's called the physical stance. You just treat the object as a physical device, and if you have all the physical knowledge you would require, um, your predictions are 100% right. So that's fine. Um, but it's completely impractical. We can't do it. So we cannot make a prediction of the next move of the chess computer if we adopt the um, the physical stance, so we better do something else. Well, what can we do? Well, we can adopt what we can call the design stance. The computer is, de is designed in a certain way. There was a programmer who originally programmed the computer, and he thought up the whole program behind this chess computer, and you can sort of look up the program and go through all the lines of the program and then see, oh, okay, now we're here, and I just moved my pawn, so now we're here in the program, and then you sort of figure out what the next move of the computer will be. That's adopting the design stance. You, you look at the machine um, through the glasses of the designer, right? So you're not really worried about all the physical properties of the thing. You, you sort of suggest, okay, the, the physical properties are as they should be. I'm now merely interested in the program, the way that the, the device is programmed. Um, that allows you to come up with a prediction much, much faster than by adopting the physical stance, right? Because you need much less computation to do this. But it's also slightly less reliable. So the physicals, adopting the physical stance is completely foolproof. It's 100% it's, it's reliable because the laws of nature are as they are. Um, in the case of the design stance, it's fairly, it's fairly reliable because usually a computer does what the programmer wants it to do. But every now and then, it doesn't do it. So for instance, if you spill coffee on the machine, um, then it, I don't know, it, something goes wrong. And if you adopt the physical stance, then you can obviously take every coffee molecule into account, or water molecule into account, and your prediction would still be accurate, but not if you adopt the design stance. But still, the design stance is a lot of work. It is 
much, much more easy, says Dennett, to simply adopt what he calls the intentional stance and pretend, well, well the word pretend, okay, I'll swallow the word pretend, and treat the machine as if it is a rational agent who knows the rules of chess and who wants to win and who's fairly rational. So you basically treat the machine as if it's a, another human chess player. And then you can come up with a prediction incredibly quickly, especially if you're sort of a, a, a trained uh, chess player, you come up with your prediction fairly quickly, much more quick than by adopting the, uh, the design stance. This is called the intentional stance. An intentional stance basically means trying to explain and predict the behavior of any system by attributing beliefs, desire, and especially rationality to a system. And you can do that. We, we, we do that all the time. And we can do it with chess computers as well. And it works. It is not as reliable as uh, adopting the design stance. Certainly not. We make mistakes. But it is incredibly quick, and we're very, very, very good at it. Now, the idea is not that we are like chess computers. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. First, it's, it's very important to see that you have one system, a chess computer, and you have three different ways of looking at it. It is not the case that any one of these three ways of looking at the chess computer is sort of privileged from a scientific point of view or from a philosophical point of view. They're just ways of understanding what the machine does. And they're different ways. And they're, uh, they're very much different when it comes to uh, complexity and, and you know, how difficult it is to actually uh, come up with a prediction. Uh, they're also different with respect to accuracy, um, but they're all sort of legitimate. That's the, the basic message. Now, the idea is not that we are chess computers, but the idea is that we can adopt the same three kind of stances with, uh, towards human beings. And in fact, says Dennett, this is what we do all the time. Um, so, um, well, the physical stance is, I, I don't know whether I need to say something about that. I mean, human beings, he says, he's a naturalist, so this is very, very important to keep in mind. He's a naturalist, he thinks human beings are physical systems, ultimately just made, out, out of, made up out of molecules. Uh, so we can adopt the physical stance to uh, 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 human beings. Uh, it's not very practical. We are way too complex to say anything sensible about ourselves in, physical, in purely physical terms. Mm. And then what about the design stance? Well, this is tricky because obviously there's no designer. Uh, there's no, uh, just, I mean, a chess computer has a designer, a programmer, but we don't have any programmers. So it's interesting to look at the design stance from, from Dennett's point of view. Um, I'll be very brief about this, just to save time to you know, tell you something about the other stuff. Um, but in his work, throughout his work, and you can find it in Brainstorms, you can find it in Intentional Stance, but also in many of the, of the later books, you can find various, um, various ways in which he looks at the so-called design stance when it comes to humans. You can look at sort of the functionality of the brain, just basically look at what neuroscientists tell us about how the brain works, um, and, and you know, which part of the brain function, has which function, basically. Um, and then you obviously adopt the design stance. You don't adopt the intentional stance yet. So if you look at the brain, and if you look at the brain's functionality, you're not, you're not sort of looking at human beings from the intentional stance. So this becomes, this becomes very important later. If you look at the brain from this perspective, you're not really looking at minds yet. This is very important. Um, so that's one way of looking at the functionality of the brain, and that's, that's basically adopting the design stance in the way that neuroscientists do it. But you can also look at it uh, from the point of view of uh, cognitive scientists. So, for instance, people who try to make artificially intelligent machine, machines, um, they also approach, I don't know, human minds, if you, if you will, from the design perspective. They try, to program, they try to figure out which way of programming produces the kind of behavior that's characteristic of us. And what you can also do is look at the way we are actually programmed. So our program, I, I just said we, we don't have a programmer, but in some sense at least, you can say that Darwinian evolution, so the, the whole process of natural selection, that is probably our programmer. So you can also look at the way that we were actually programmed in the course of our phylogenetic history. 
Uh, and you can find all three takes, so to speak, of the intentional, on the intentional stance throughout Dennett's work. So the design stance, when it comes to humans, is a tricky <coughs> and complex bit. But the really interesting um, uh, a stance to look at here, and I suspect also as a kind of background for his, uh, for his lecture on, on Saturday, is the intentional stance. Um, and here, I mean, apart from the fact that we are immensely more complex beings than chess computers, the, ba the idea basically is the same. And the idea is, and this is, the, this is sort of the bottom line of the intentional stance theory, the idea is um, we call any system legitimately intentional, i.e. a system with beliefs and desires and hopes and fears, um, when the behavior of this system can fairly accurately be predicted and understood and yeah, explained to some degree in terms of the ascription of beliefs, desires, hopes and, and, and other attitudes. So if we can understand the behavior of a system in terms of beliefs, desires, etc., then it does have beliefs and desires, according to the intentional stance theory. Um, this is so, you can find a whole lot of sort of philosophical influences uh, for this idea, but um, uh, his, his tutor in, in Oxford, Gilbert Ryle, is, is probably the main guy behind this. Um, and very many people think, oh, but this is behaviorism. This is, a sort of, this is wrong. This is a sort of as-if theory. Basically, what Dennett is saying is that there are no such things as mind. The only thing that exists is behavior, and we describe that in terms of the mind. That is sort of, and that was generally the perception of his theory, especially in the, in the 1970s and 1980s, and perhaps even still. Um, and he, here it becomes tricky. Because there is something to that perception of the theory. There is something very behavioristic in the theory of Daniel Dennett. And at the same time, um, what I'm going to do after this is basically say, um, that isn't that bad. Uh, it doesn't mean that Dennett, will, that Dennett is denying the existence of mind. On the contrary, he's, he's basically saying, this is the best strategy of defending the reality of the mind, and later on free will, we get to free will uh, in, I don't know, 50 minutes or so. Um, this is the best way to go. So this is a tricky, tricky thing. I, I was talking to someone from, uh, from Vox uh, magazine here, and um, w while I was talking to her, I, sort of, I suddenly realized that in, in the 1970s and 1980s, he was sort of regarded as, you know, as I don't know, perhaps, perhaps in, in, in about the same way that many people regard Dick Swap in Holland now as sort of, you know, the, 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 the evil guy who wants to reduce everything and he wants to deny the mind, etc. And now the perception is completely the other way. It's, it's, sort, of, it's, it's, it's sort of turned around in the sense that, that people begin to realize that this, prob that this is probably the best way of defending the reality of mind against some sort of neuro-reductionism. Um, so there is, there is this really tricky status to this theory. And I, I will try to explain why, why this is the case and why this is not just a sort of uh, very, I don't know, boorish sort of uh, uh, behaviorism. Why it's, it's much more than that. Okay, so this is the intentional stance theory. And once again, the, the, the idea is that systems, such as you, know, you and me, um, really have beliefs and desires when the behavior of these systems can accurately be described, predicted, and explained in terms of those beliefs and desires. That, that is what um, having beliefs and desires actually amounts to. Um, two things are, well, yeah. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll do it in sort of two or three steps. This is a very, very, very important distinction. The distinction between the so-called personal level of description and the subpersonal level of, of description. Uh, I'll first explain the distinction and then come back to beliefs and desires and explain why this is so crucial to understand that then it is not denying the reality of mind, on the contrary. So the distinction is actually uh, not developed in the intentional science, but earlier, it's, it's a distinction that stems from his first book, Content and Consciousness. And he basically says, uh, it's a very simple distinction. Um, the subpersonal level of description is the level of description of people or systems in general uh, in terms of their parts, right? So my intestines, uh, uh, describing my intestines is describing me at the subpersonal level. Describing my 
uh, bloodstream is describing something of me on the subpersonal level. Yeah? Describing, I don't know, describing my brain processes. It's describing some processes in me at the subpersonal level. Yeah? So brain processes are very important. Brain processes are at the subpersonal level. They are not at the level of persons as a whole. They are, level, they are at the level of parts of persons. The personal level of description, by contrast, is simply the level of description uh, of people as whole systems. Not as being composed of parts, but as whole systems. That's it. That's the, that's the, that's the basic dis uh, distinction. Now, the crucial thing is, and this is also derived from Ryle, mm. the crucial thing is that mental states, if you ascribe mental states to uh, a system, you do that at the personal level. So, and this is very important throughout his works, um, brains don't have beliefs, people have beliefs. Brains don't have desires, people have desires. People have emotions, people have hopes, people have fears. But not brains. And this is absolutely crucial, because if you, if you understand this, then you might, so if you go back, I don't know, if you go back to the intentional stance idea, you would think, oh my God, but he's just saying that it's the ascription of beliefs that makes belief, that, 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 that is all there is to say about beliefs. It's not, they're not really there. But then, then it said, hang on, what you're, what you're implicitly presupposing is that beliefs are brain states. Right? And if you think that beliefs, if you, if you really think that the reality of, belie of beliefs has to be the reality of some sort of brain structure, then adopt it, uh, uh, accepting the intentional stance theory is basically denying the reality of beliefs. And you're basically saying, okay, but there are no, things, no such things as beliefs. It's just that you know, we have a sort of make-do or make-believe beliefs, right? As if beliefs, namely in our ascriptions, but they're not really there. But then this is the idea of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the difference in levels of descriptions. Then it says, beliefs were never at home at the subpersonal level to begin with. So you shouldn't look for beliefs in the brain. This doesn't mean that the brain is not important for having beliefs. Obviously it is, because the brain drives our behavior. And it's the behavior that we describe and predict and explain in terms of beliefs. So there is a connection. But the connection between beliefs on the one hand and the brain on the other is always mediated by behavior. There's always behavior in, betwe in, in between. So this is very crucial. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't know whether I will convince you or not, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do my best at least. And uh, in the 1970s, uh, many people were not convinced, very many people. And many people thought that Dannett was some sort of radical, and he was a sort of radical denier of, of the mind, basically. And, oh yeah, you know, there's something left of the mind, it is what we ascribe. And that is how many people saw it. But Dannett himself sees, saw, well, still sees things differently. He says, no. I'm not a radical, I'm actually sort of, you know, uh, the mild guy in between. And, and in some sense, there is, you know, there's something to be said for that. Because in those days, you had people like Jerry Fodor, and he's, I mean, he's still alive and he's still around, and he says, and this is what Dennett calls industrial strength mental realism, he says, mental states, if they exist, they exist as brain states. And very many people nowadays think that too. And on the other hand, you have people like Paul Churchland, and they, say, they basically say, oh no, the mental, the whole idea of a mind is a theory, and the theory turns out to be false the more we find out about the brain. So the more we find out about the brain, the more we have to come to realize that the whole notion of a mind was just a myth to begin with. So let's just do away with all the mind talk and just talk about the brain. This is the way to go. And then it says, these are two extremes. So on the one hand, the extreme is people. So on the one hand, there's Jerry Fodor who says, the mind, if it's real, has to be a brain state. It has to be a collection of brain states. On the other hand is, is Paul Church, and he says, yeah, if the mind, the only thing for the mind to be real is to be, to be something non-scientific. Now that we've found out about how the brain really works, we don't need the concept of mind. Do away with the concept of mind. Just stick to the brain. And then it says, well, they're both wrong, and they're both too extreme. You can, just, you can have a middle position, and he calls that mild realism. Um, and I'll, I'll spend some time, I will try to explain mild realism. I'll do my best at least, and then skip from that to, uh, uh, to the free, free will idea. So 
how can you be a mild realist? The idea basically is, again, systems are minded, have beliefs and desires, if we can explain the behavior uh, of these systems in terms of beliefs and desires. At the personal level of description, at the level of the system as a whole. And many people think, well, you know, that's just as if minds. That's not really minds. Well, it says, it says in it, what do you mean with real? When, when can we say that a mental state is really real? Well, says Jerry Fodor, if it's a brain state, then it's real. Well, says Dennett, that, that's one option, but it's probably not the best option, and it's certainly not the best option if you realize that our mentalistic vocabulary, right, the, the words we use to describe minds are always used at the level of persons as a whole. If you realize that, it's probably a better way of looking at the reality of minds. And how shall we do that? Well, um, I'll now skip, I'll, I'll go to an example that he uses to, as it's one of the many examples that he uses to explain why you should be a realist and in what sense we have to be realists with respect to minds and later on free will. It's, um, it's an example, so it, this is just a sort of a, a job. It's an example, um, it's called the game of life and it's, uh, I have a video about it which explains it much quicker than I can. And uh, I was going to show you some more, but I won't because I'm, I'm I don't know, I don't have enough time. Uh, maybe, maybe in the discussion. I'll, I'll show the video and you can, um, I will discuss later on. Um, and I'll skip the first half, no bit. I don't know. Uh, Robert that shows a how a complex thing like the mind might come about from a basic oh, set of rules. That was just what I wanted to skip, so you didn't hear that. Um, uh, this, this is just a sort of a computer simulation, a game. You just use it as a parallel example. So far, this doesn't have anything to do with the mind. Any pretense that it does, and many people do, uh, do pretend, it's not relevant now, okay? The simulation consists of a grid, a bit like a chessboard extending infinitely in all directions. Each square of the grid can either be lit up, which he called alive, or dark, which he called dead. Whether a given square is dead or alive depends on what is happening in the eight other squares that surround it. For example, if a living square like this one has no living squares nearby, the rules say it will die of loneliness. If a living square is surrounded by more than three other living squares, the square will also die of overcrowding. But if a dead square is surrounded by three living squares, it becomes lit, or is born. Once you set an initial state of living squares and let the simulation run... Just to go in, in, in between, uh, this is not entirely correct. So uh, <laughs> the, the rule is slightly more complex, but the rule is ex still extremely simple. Uh, it is this. Um, if a square is on and it's surrounded by two living squares, so squares which are also on, it will stay on. If it is uh, surrounded by three living squares, it will go on. I, if it's dead, it will go on. If it's alive, it will stay on. In all other cases, it will die, as, so it will go off. That's the, that's the only rule. So it's a very, very, very simple rule. Uh, and that's, that's the whole point about this. This is a very simple rule, but see what These you get if you let it run. simple laws determine what happens in the future. The results are surprising. As the program progresses, shapes appear and disappear spontaneously. Collections of shapes move across the grid, bouncing off one another, 
There are whole kinds of objects, species, that interact. Some can even reproduce, just as life does in the real world. These complex properties emerge from simple laws that contain no concepts like movement or reproduction. It's possible to imagine that something like the game of life, with only a few basic laws, might produce highly complex features. Perhaps even intelligence. It might take a grid with many billions of squares, but that's not surprising. We have many hundreds of billions of cells in our brains. Right. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, so who of you is not, is, is familiar with this example and who, who's familiar? Okay, uh, not, who's not familiar, the rest? Oh, okay. Um, I'll, I'll just take some, a little bit more time to just explain them. Um, so I'll, 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 just, I'll just go through this very briefly. The, ex the example, this is an example that figures in, I don't know, throughout Dennett's works. And he uses it for various purposes, and because it, it's a sort of, I don't know, multi-purpose example. It's a very, very uh, illuminating example. Um, and I'll do two things with it. I'll explain the reality of the mental in a minute. You, you, you won't see the connection yet, but you will. Uh, and I'll explain his stance on free will using this example. So, and so does he. Um, so this is just, just to show you in a little bit more detail uh, what, uh, what the example is. So this is a... Uh, um, now, look at this thing. Look at this shape. And we now apply these very simple rules. Yeah? So uh, once again, if, it's, uh, if a square is alive and it's uh, surrounded by two living cells, it will stay alive. Um, if it is surrounded by three cells, it will stay as it is. So if it's dead, it will stay dead. If it's alive, it will stay alive. In all other cases, it will die. That's the rule. It's an incredibly simple rule. Now look at this shape. Uh, and we go from step to step. So the next step is this. And then you do this. And then this. And then, hey, we've seen that one before. I don't know if you can recognize it. So we'll do it four times more. One, two, three, four. There it is again. What you can also see is that it sort of it has shifted its place throughout the grid. It moves sort of to the uh, to the lower right um, um, corner of the of the field. So if you let it run, you get this. Yeah, this is called a glider. Uh, this is a very simple, a very simple. I don't know what is it. Organism? No, it's not organism. Being, thing, entity. But that's the thing. Now, I'll, I'll, uh, so. Um, in, one, in some sense, it's, I mean, who says this, is, this glider is a thing, is an entity? It's not, it's not an object. Oh, oh it's gone. <laughs> I'll, uh, hang on. Uh, clear, and then I'll go. There it is again. This looks like one thing moving through, moving sort of <laughs> over there. It's gone again. Okay. Um, moving over the grid, right? It looks like one thing. But is it? It's a sort of, it, you can also say, you no, know, it's not really a thing. It's a collection of dots that just go on and off. Yeah, it is, it is both, right? It's not that one perspective is right and the other is wrong. So remember the chess computer, remember uh, the human being, remember the difference of stances, that y you can take different stances towards the same thing, right? We can say this is a collection of dots. Why? Well, because it is a collection of dots. That's just not very controversial. But you can also look at it, and you can say, oh, but that's a glider. And uh, for this purpose, it's probably not so incredibly um, uh, necessary to call it a glider. But then maybe you see this machine, or thing, spaceship it's called, uh, and th it does this. So it moves in a different direction, basically. Uh, now it might become interesting to distinguish gliders from spaceships. And then you get more complex um, thingies. This is a really tricky one. This is, this is well, well designed and it's still extremely simple. Extremely simple. Uh, but this interesting thing does this. It's called a gun. And a gun produces gliders. Look. It will produce gliders. That's the first one. And you get, see, now you have a gun that produces gliders. 
Now it becomes much more difficult to describe everything that's going on here just in terms of dots on a, uh, on, on a surface. It's much easier to say, okay, here we have a gun, and the gun is producing gliders. And you can do all sorts of, you know, I, I can do sort of complex things, I can just mess this up and, I don't know, uh, can I do this? No, I can't. No. I have to do it dot by dot, but if I, now I mess it up, now it will probably sort of, I don't know, I, I have no idea what it does. So it's unpredictable from my point of view at least, you get this. Uh, will it mess? Yeah, it's messy. Uh, yeah, it's destroyed. Now, it's, now I can say, the gun is destroyed. This is what happens, right? Uh, will, maybe a glider will be produced, maybe not. We'll see. Usually, every now and then, you get a glider. Oh, this is interesting. It goes on forever. Okay, well, <laughs> uh, ultimately, they will sort of end up with stable shapes, but not now. <laughs> so this, okay, but this, this, uh, this is enough to, to sort of drive home the point. The point is that uh, by now, uh, it just won't do to speak of, of dots on a grid anymore. It is much easier to adopt a different perspective on it. You just you know, put up a different set of goggles and look at it through the, um, w with a, a kind of view of, you know, where are the gliders going? Oh, the, the glider gun is destroyed. Uh, and I, I don't know, I just inserted a couple of dots and it, they wreak havoc and now you get this and uh, you get a, a couple of stable shapes. Sometimes you might even be lucky and get a spaceship. I, I never got a, sh a spaceship actually by, by, by accident. Uh, but it might happen. Um, it's a different perspective. The thing, is here, the thing here is that um, at some level of complexity, you need the language of spaceships and gliders in order to describe what's going on. You just need it, right? And that's the same with the intentional stance. It's not, he's not saying that we are like this, so that's why I just skipped the first bit of this video, because they were sort of saying that you know, we can sort of imitate the mind with this. That's not the point. Not at this stage, at least. The point is that at some stage, at some level of complexity, you need a different, kind, different way of looking at systems, and you can describe them better in terms of in this case, a sort of higher level description in terms of gliders and spaceships and guns. That's the point of the, uh, of the example when it comes to um, the intentional stance. So that's, that's what this example does. It shows you that really at some point it is much, much, much more useful to adopt the language of gliders. Are gliders real? Yeah, sure they're real. Why? Because they're really good descriptions of what goes on and we can explain and predict what the system does in terms of gliders and guns. So that's how real they are, they're pretty real. Are they industrial strength real? Are they as real as tables and chairs? No, they're not. They are sort of virtually real. But they are real enough, says Dennett. So this is his mild realism. It is not the realism of people who say that the mind is actually in the brain as a physical item, but it's not eliminativism either. It's not saying that we, can, we might as well do away with the mind. We need the mind at the personal level of, this, uh, of description in order to explain and predict human behavior. And we cannot do without it. We need the language of mental state terms. That's the, that's the basic idea of the intentional stance theory. Um, it's an, it's, I mean, the longer you think about, about, about this theory, the more you come to see how ingenious it is. It is really cleverly thought out, and it allows us to solve a lot of problems that especially neuroscientists and also philosophers of neuroscience run into these days. So it's, and it's an old theory. It's 1971, sort of, uh, sort of updated later on in the, uh, in the early 80s, and that's it. But it's a long time ago, and actually now we're beginning to see you know, what, what the real worth of the theory is. Okay, but I have to move on, because otherwise I won't get to free will. Um, but conveniently, I'll, oh, hang on, um, I can use the same example there. Um, so that helps a lot. Um, but first, it's, it's, it's I'm, I'm, I, I, I opted for the intentional stance instead, instead of his theory of consciousness because I think that uh, the title of his talk in, in, on Saturday is something like uh, free will is as real as euros and promises and something else. Um, and I sort of suspected that this would be about a kind of mild realism about the freedom of the will as well. So that's why I thought the intentional science theory would be uh, 
helpful. But when it comes to free will, so there are two books of free will, uh, two, two books about free will that he wrote. Um, about this first one, this is Elbow Room, 1984. About the first one, it's important to mention uh, the subtitle because the subtitle is brilliant. Um, and it's, uh, it's often ignored. It says, uh, Elbow Room, it's also a very nice title, uh, but it's about the varieties of free will worth wanting. So um, one thing is impo very important, it's just from the title already you can get the idea that there is no such thing as, there's no one notion of free will. There are many notions of free will. There's a variety of versions of free will. And then the question we need to ask is, you know, which ones of those are the ones that are worth wanting? This is very, very important because uh, many attacks on free will, like it's on, on Friday he will be debating uh, Dick Swap. Dick Swap's notion of free will is uh, an, an act, we act out of free will when our choice sort of emerges out of nothing, i.e. when our choice does not have a cause. Well, if you call that free will, it's fine with me, but it's, is, it is it worth wanting? Is it worth defending? Does anyone defend that? Probably not. Mm. So the first thing then it says is we need, we need to sort of carve out the notions of free will that are real enough for us to worry about. So that's, that's just the sort of thing that I think is very much uh, uh, worth mentioning. Then we get to his notions of free will and the notion of free will that he thinks uh, we ought to worry about. And then we can go back to the um, uh, uh, game of life example because he uses, the, he uses exactly the same example in that book Again, and it helps a lot because I've already explained it. Um, you can see on the, on the cover of this version of the book already that the whole notion of, um, say, patterns, so like you see the patterns in the game of life, but patterns in this case in flocks of birds, uh, plays an important role. Uh, um, and I'll explain why. First, when it comes to free will, most people are worried about determinism. That's not the only thing to worry about. I, sh I should say that it's this in advance. Determinism is, a, is probably a sort of troublesome concept if you want to believe in free will. Why? Well, because for one thing, it's sort of, it's alleged to, I mean, the, the problem with determinism is, is that many people think if determinism is true, we don't really have any choices. There's nothing for us to choose. Uh, this is hotly debated, and actually most philosophers are so-called compatibilists, and compatibilists believe that free will and determinism are, as the word says, compatible. Um, they're not, I mean, they appear to be sort of incompatible with, I mean, they, they appear, they, it appears that if the world is deterministic, there cannot be such a thing as free will. Most philosophers, but not all, mm, want to argue in one way or another that even though the world is deterministic, we can have such a thing as free will. And Dennis is one of them. And his way of doing this, of explaining this, is, um, is yeah, it's, it's very original. And it's, it's definitely not uh, copied by, by, by someone else. Okay, so determinism is the main worry. Um, if you agree that that is that sort of the main worry, it's not the only worry. The, there are various other options, uh, other things to worry about. But if determinism is the main worry, well, then the example of the game of life comes in handy again. Why? Well, because the game of life is entirely deterministic. We've just heard the rules of the game of life, and those are the rules, right? So it's about a square being surrounded by two or three other squares, and then in, in other, other cases it will die. That's the rules, and it's exceptionless. It's entirely, completely, thoroughly deterministic. There's no wiggle room, no elbow room there. It's just, it, it runs as it is um, prescribed by the computer or by the program or, or whoever. So it's deterministic. Well, but if you look at, the, uh, at, at various sort of higher level, really complex um, patterns in the game of life, you get very interesting uh, you, get, you, you can get incredibly interesting uh, patterns. So this is a, uh, I won't go into this, but for, for those of you familiar with it, this is a Mandelbrot fractal. Uh, it's an incredibly complex structure of, uh, realized in the world, so to speak, of the game of life. It's incredibly complex and it behaves in a sort of lifelike way. Um, these are also structures in the game of life, but obviously, you know, zoomed out from and, 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 and I mean, like, really, 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 really far zoomed out. I mean, it's like, 
Um, it's not like these white things are anything like uh, the dots uh, on the grid. The, dot, the dots on the grid cannot be seen. But you get this sort of cellular-like structures in the game of life. Right? It's still entirely deterministic, but deterministic at an extremely low level, at the level of the individual dots. And you can't see the dots here. The dots are like molecules in, in, in the cells of our body, right? So they're extremely small. And if you zoom out far enough, you get systems that are absolutely unpredictable uh, and that sort of, I don't know, have, have this sort of lifelike structure. And you get systems like, I mean, the, the glider. We can, we can call gliders gliders and we can call spaceships spaceships. Well, we can see that the glider consists of five dots. That's it. Five or six, I don't know. But a very few dots. But here you can have organisms or entities that are so complex that you can't even count the dots. And then it becomes much more, um, I don't know, of much higher explanatory value to just call that an entity or maybe an organism. It's not really an organism. It, it, it exists in a computer. It's still an example. But the example is very instructive. Uh, why? Well, for one thing, the things become unpredictable, but much more importantly, um, it is very helpful to describe these beings as being sort of autonomous. You can sort of single them out and say, okay, there's a cell, or I don't know, you give them names, you say, that's Bob, and there's Ellen, and there's Fred, and they sort of bump into each other, and, oh, what happens? Oh, well, Fred dies. Uh, that sort of stuff happens in the world, in, in the life world, right? Uh, but some organisms, um, they sort of manage to stay alive and even procreate. That also happens, just as in the real world. So now we skip to the real world, world but um, we, we, keep, um, we keep the basic picture of the, of the uh, game of life world. Um, so in the game of life world, the very bottom level, the bottom level of pixels is deterministic. If you zoom out, the world becomes unpredictable and you get systems that have some sort of autonomy, systems that can survive and procreate, etc. Um, but at the bottom level, it's still deterministic. Well, says Dennett, that's the same, very probably the same in our world. We never know for sure whether our world is deterministic, but if it's deterministic, uh, it's deterministic at the very bottom level, at the level of these tiny physical particles. At every higher level, things become much more complex and much more unpredictable. But we do see the same as in the a game of life. You see organisms emerge that have some sort of autonomy. Organisms that can stay alive and that can procreate. Yeah, so far so good. So that can all still be deterministic. One thing obviously in, in that, that sort of might hint at free will is the un unpredictability. But that is not the way that then it goes. Um, here's a much more interesting idea. It says, okay, now look at these organisms. And these organisms, they become ever more complex. Um, and they, some organisms manage to stay alive. But if you look at very simple organisms, um, they, that, that's, that's about what they do. They stay alive and every now and then they get eaten by other organisms. Oh, it's just bad luck and they can't do anything about it. So that's not very free for those animals. If you, if you can't do anything, if you can't avoid being eaten by uh, another organism, uh, you're sort of, I don't know, at the mercy of nature. There's just no point in calling you, uh, you're assigning any sort of autonomy or freedom to you. But if you evolve so that you might be able to avoid the kinds of situations that you as an organism would like to avoid, things become different. We're still talking about the deterministic world, right? So still, I mean, in this duck, is it duck? Yeah, it's duck. Um, the, every molecule in this duck is determined by the laws of nature, but the duck itself is at such an incredibly, inc incomparably higher level of complexity that it doesn't really, it's not really informative to say, oh yeah, but the duck is determined. Well, no, the duck is not determined. Uh, all the molecules the duck is made of are determined, but the duck itself is a very unpredictable uh, uh, entity. But it's an entity that manages to avoid certain, uh, at least I hope he does, uh, uh, and he, at least this duck tries to avoid a certain kind of situation. It tries to avoid being eaten. Whether or not it succeeds, we never know. Um, but you might think of organisms that do succeed in not being eaten, that do succeed in avoiding the kinds of situations that are detrimental to them. And 
you, and this is a concept that it is very, very, very nice word, then it calls this evitability. So uh, some things are inevitable, uh, they just happen and you can't do anything about it, but some things um, you can do something about it, they are evitable, you can avoid them. And evitability is his sort of his stepping stone towards freedom. Um, the more evitability we acquire, the more free we are. The more we are able to avoid the kind of situations that we would like to avoid. That's evitability. And the whole point of freedom evolves, and this is obviously very, uh, this, is, this is not the whole point, but the, sort of the bottom line is that throughout the course of evolution, many organisms uh, de develop various degrees of evitability. And obviously we are really good at it. We, we have become organ I mean, we, we can really sort of manage our surroundings in such a way that is really, you know, that, that, that is very much um, beneficial for us. And we can avoid the kinds of situations, most of them at least, that we would like to avoid. And to the extent that we can, then it says, uh, we can be called free. So this is the whole idea. Freedom is something that might actually be the product of evolution. And not despite the fact that the universe is deterministic, but thanks to the f fact that the universe is deterministic. If it were not deterministic, you wouldn't get the kinds of organization in system that, for instance, the, the, the game of life shows us we can have. Right? So it's determinism and evolution, precisely the two things that many people think are you're completely counter to the, the, the idea of free will. So many, many people think evolution and determinism are, are, are the things that sort of threaten free will, and then it says, no, they enable free will. But, and this is important, it is free will of the kind worth wanting, right? Uh, not being eaten by predators is a kind of freedom, freedom worth wanting. Having a choice that has no causes, he says, that's, that's not the kind of freedom that's worth wanting. Okay, um, I think, yeah. This is, I think, this is, I'll, I'll, I'll stick to this uh, uh, summary of, uh, uh, of Daniel Dance. This is it. <laughs>